Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to start slowly to make sure that uh, participants will have a bit of time to join us. Um, thanks a lot for joining us today to our event, the Green Deal and the Nordic Capitals, Urban Solutions to Climate, Nature and Biodiversity Challenges. This seminar is organized by the European offices of the Nordic Capital Regions of Helsinki, Copenhagen, Stockholm and Oslo, and it's taking place in the framework of the EU Green Week. My name is Luis Cofino. I work for EuroCities, a network of more than 200 major European cities, and I will be your moderator for this event. But before we start, let me go through a couple of housekeeping rules. Please remember to mute yourself and turn off your video during the whole seminar. Ask your questions or comments in the meeting chat that you can find by clicking on the speaking bot bubble at the top of your team window. We will take questions in the chat during the whole seminar, so don't hesitate to write your questions there. There will be time for a brief question and answer session after each presentation and at the end of the seminar. If we have time at the end, there will be also an opportunity to take the floor and ask your question live directly to the speakers. The presentation will be sent to you afterwards, and I would like to inform you that the seminar will be recorded. So now we have sorted the housekeeping rules, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. We'll first hear a keynote speech from Benjamin Kaspar, Policy Advisor on Biodiversity at the Commission's Director General for Environment. Then Paul Molson, biologist in the Technical and Environmental Administration of the Municipality of Copenhagen. Followed by Gunilla Hood, ecologist at the Environment and Health Department of the City of Stockholm. Karin Erzberg, Special Advisor for International Climate Cooperation at the City of Oslo. Leona Silberstein from the Urban Environment Division of the City of Helsinki. And finally, we will have some closing remarks by Janine Halm Eriksson, member of the Swedish Parliament for the Green Party and member of the Nordic Council's Committee for Sustainable Nordic Region. During the seminar, I will receive the help uh, of Ingel, Ingvild Jakobsen from the Oslo Region European Office, who will manage the chat box and help with the questions and comments from the audience. So a big welcome to all of you and thanks a lot for joining us today. This year, EU Green Week is an opportunity to rethink our relationship with nature, to ask ourselves how unsustainable our human activities are, driving to biodiversity loss and natural resources depletion. Over the last 40 years, the global wildlife population fell by 60% because of human activities. And we are not doing ourselves any favors as more than 50% of global GDP depends on nature, as well as our well-being and health. Nature-based solutions can contribute to improve cities' resili resilience, mitigate impact of climate change. In this context, our event will focus on the European Green Deal, this Commission flagship initiative aiming at making Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050, and will pre present some measures and strategies, such as the EU biodiversity strategy and the circular economy action plan, relevant to help to help protect nature excuse me, to protect, restore and sustainably manage nature. As you know, Nordic cities are known for being green cities with lots of accessible green and blue spaces surrounded by agricultural land, forests and lakes. In fact, you are going to see beautiful pictures during this seminar. They are also, also known for being front runners in the green and climate transition. Most of them have been already committed to reach climate neutrality well before 2050. And they will, for instance, apply for being part of the 100 cities to reach climate neutrality by 2030 that will be selected for the mission on climate neutral and smart cities in the upcoming Horizon Europe program. Nordic cities are overflowing with solutions to climate, nature and biodiversity challenges, and they will present some of their strategies and action plan during our seminar today. But uh, before we move to cities, I would like to give the floor to our keynote speaker, Benjamin Kaspar, working for the DG Environment at the European Commission, who will give us an overview on the urban aspects of the EU biodiversity strategy and how can urban areas deliver on the strategy. So, Benjamin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. All right. Well, um, my my plan is not to necessarily go into enormous detail on the biodiversity strategy because I mean I will just run over it and I'll maybe explain why it's so why I'm so excited about it why you know the the general political um, atmosphere at the moment uh, and why I think we've got a great opportunity. I'll run through it very briefly, but hopefully you've you've maybe looked at it or read it or heard about it or looked at the press releases. Um, and I think what I really would like to do is to talk to you a bit about how uh, cities and you know implementation at the local level can help deliver the biodiversity strategy aims and what you need from from us in the European Commission. And what we need from you, uh, the cities that are generally leading the way. So I'm, I, I think focus more. I can send our standard presentation afterwards and you can have the presentation about the biodiversity strategy. It's the same as the press release. It's the same as the introduction to the strategy itself. So you can always read about it and, and see a little bit. But what I want to talk about is is how excited I am about it. <laughs> Mainly that's going to be my focus and then talk about this local local angle. And that I think there's a gosh, there's a picture of me there actually in Oslo. So I, I was uh, previously working on <clears throat> the European Green Capital Award and urban environment policy. And now I'm working in um, the biodiversity team. So I'm still dealing with urban issues, but more from a biodiversity angle. So I've been working in DG Environment for 15 years. I've been in the Commission for almost 20 years and I've been working on environment policy for the whole of my career. Uh, I was in the UK before and luckily now I have a European nationality as well so I can stay working in the European Commission. Um, and I've never really been uh, never seen environment policy sort of so well regarded or so high on the political agenda anyway and that's with this new commission with uh, our new president uh, and our commissioner we we seem to have not just a big uh, high visibility push for environment policy but i think they take it very seriously in in also our vice president uh, Franz Tinnemans and, and I think you, you find that they, they genuinely believe and understand that biodiversity is not something that is nice to have, that sits on the side, that it is absolutely critical that we have to deal with it now, that it's part of the climate change issue as well but I mean even bigger and for me you know saying oh well let's deal with climate change first and then worry about biodiversity later is just completely misunderstanding the whole thing and I think that's represented in the new biodiversity strategy um, and there are lots of things in it which are, are new they are much bolder than they, we've ever had before now whether we can actually deliver them because it, a lot of it is words and whether we can actually you know come forward with practical implementation and, and achieve some of these things remains to be seen and I'm going to be doing my best to try and do that um, so I'll just run a little bit that's the the sort of background um, I'm not going to talk about how serious the problem is because I'm hoping that all of you know that uh, and you've already outlined in your introduction uh, some of the you know the the terrifying things we we you know I think the thing that people need to realize is that GDP as well as our lives are completely linked to biodiversity. Half of global GDP is linked to nature. I think it's, I mean, that's the phrase we have in our presentations. I think it's probably significantly more than that. I think it's 100% of GDP. If we didn't have nature, we would be in some weird post-apocalyptic world and G GDP wouldn't be relevant. Um, so the connections between biodiversity loss, climate change and pandemics are now being realised and restoring biodiversity is an absolutely key part of the Green Deal. It's highlighted, it's one of the main priorities officially of the Commission now. Um, so that's a really good thing and that means not just in terms of policy making but also in financing and making sure that across the board in other areas biodiversity loss is addressed. So we don't just have active policies, we have to make sure our sort of passive policies are not harming biodiversity as well. 
Um, I think that's harder to do, but anyway. Um, so the biodiversity strategy is broken into four parts, protecting nature, enabling transformative change, restoring nature, and then we've got our ambitious global agenda as well, which is something uh, maybe we're not going to focus on a lot today, but I think that that is going at the by the end of Green Week, um, that is going to be where the focus our focus turns. We get our house in order, but we've also got to lead the way globally. Um, in terms of protecting nature, we've got some incredibly uh, new, ambitious new targets, uh, proposals, and personally, I'm, that's what I'm working on and I'm really excited about. Um, one is a, a, an enormous um, increase in our protected areas by 2030. So we're talking about protecting 30% of EU land and sea, starting from our Natura 2000 network of nationally designated areas um, and going uh, sort of EU wide and adding local areas as well. Um, I think the urban, a, a lot, there are a lot more Natura 2000 areas in urban settings and settings than people realise. Um, and so hopefully that can expand as well and, and, and we can play a big role in, in, in urban areas of, of increasing our protected areas. Um, some of those areas are going to be strictly protected. So this is of the 30% uh, protected areas in the EU of land and sea, uh, one third, so a total of 10% will be strictly protected. And that's, we're gonna be looking at the high value biodiversity areas the ones which are really important for climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation as well. Um, and that will include, for example, primary and old growth forests. So that strict protection is a really big, new, bold uh, policy measure. Um, and then we're going to come up with an EU restoration plan. So that means we're not just going to do protection, we're going to do, we're going to actively restore. Um, and that's something that we're currently starting uh, to look into, how we're going to draft a legal proposal, because we're talking about the possibility of binding targets. I don't have any slides, sorry. I'm, I, I can, I mean, I could share my screen, but the slides are, yeah, let me, let me, uh, let me share my screen. I didn't, I didn't send the slides, but can I? No, I think I'm going to struggle. I mean, we will send your slides afterwards, uh, Benjamin. So if you want to, to go on, you can. Yeah, the point is there's a big, bold restoration plan uh, for 2030, which is talking about setting legally binding targets uh, for in, in all the key ecosystems. So we're starting from the uh, latest EU assessment of ecosystems and their services, the mass report, which is just about to be published and we're looking at each of the different key ecosystems and saying well what do we need to, to restore EU nature what do we need to do in each of those areas um, and we're then going to try and set up a legally binding framework to make sure that we actually reach these targets um, what we're really looking into is what hasn't worked in the past and what we need to do to make it work this time round. So that's the, these, the, the main points of the biodiversity strategy in terms of the EU restoration plan are, are highlighted uh, if you just search for it on, on Google and, and they are in our press release. So we're talking about the legally binding targets. We're talking about no more deterioration of protected habitats. Uh, we're talking about getting favorable status or a positive trend. Uh, uh, at least by 2030, at least 30% of all our ecosystems. There's there's actions in relation to organic farming, uh, biodiversity, uh, rich agriculture, um, reduction in pesticides, uh, and, and 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 on pollution as well. And we're also talking about uh, with our colleagues in the climate change department, um, the planting of additional trees respecting ecological principles. So we've got a really bold and ambitious sort of framework to work from, one that I've never never had the pleasure to, to be working from uh, before. Um, so I'm not going to go in, in any more detail on that, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what, what, what it says on urban. Um, 
basically there's this request, this call to member states and to cities um, that all cities really, and we've met, said those over 20, so all towns, over 20,000 uh, inhabitants should come forward by the end of next year with urban greening plans. Um, for me, this is uh, basically about cities looking at their, their green spaces, their nature, their biodiversity, the looking from the perspective of adaptation to climate change, uh, looking at the, the the species that they have, thinking about the pollution to their water sources, all these sorts of these things, which I think a lot of the Nordic cities represented here today who are going to speak have already done. They've been doing it for years. I, I've worked with lots of you on the European Green Capital Award. Um, but we want it to become the norm that a city has uh, some form of action plan uh, on on its biodiversity and nature. Uh, and so what we're going to do is to try and 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 provide guidance and support and help cities uh, and you know, local administrations to, to deliver some of these ambitious biodiversity targets on the ground at, at the urban level. Um, we've said that we're going to set up a new urban greening platform. Um, so I, I would say that where, what we currently have is we have our green capital award and a, a green capital network of cities. We have various slightly disparate um, activities around the commission. We have a green city tool um, and we, we're we really pushing on this new green city accord, which is a bit like a sort of covenant of mayors, but we're looking at other environmental areas and one of them being nature and biodiversity. So to, uh, I think, look to bring all these different things together under this green city platform and when a city or a local administration comes forward and says okay we'll take biodiversity a bit more seriously what does that entail then we can provide guidance uh support uh best practices and also uh, financing and and i think that's something really important to say all, all throughout this new biodiversity push uh, over the coming years, we need to make sure that all our different policies, including our financing, are both helping support what we want to do in terms of biodiversity and also not competing against it. So it's a big ask. Uh, obviously, the European Union doesn't have um, competence to act at city level. Uh, that's for member states to do. So we're just gonna do all we can to help and support um, setting these broader targets and, and hoping that cities can can help deliver. Uh, we have a lot of various regional initiatives and we want to bring those together as well uh, so we can say this is our urban greening platform and, and hopefully we'll be able to launch something uh, something next year but we're still talking about it and thinking about it. Um, I think that's probably all I should say for now, because I think it'd be better to answer questions rather than keep ranting away. And I've only got another five minutes anyway, so. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. Thanks a lot. If you have any question for Benjamin, please uh, write in the chat box and we'll ask the question to Benjamin. But as I'm the moderator, I'm going to take uh, the first question uh, to you, Benjamin. Um, I'm glad you talked about the Green City Accord because this is also what I wanted to touch upon with you here. Um, how do you see concretely uh, the, you know, the, it's so interlinked. So how do you see concretely the work between the Green City Accord and these urban uh, greening plans? Yeah, I mean, I would like them to be one in the same thing, essentially. So uh, when with the Green City Accord, we're basically uh, saying if you're a city who's, say, part of the Covenant of Mayors and, you know, that framework, I've always been quite impressed to some extent with the uptake in the Covenant of Mayors. And they have a sort of step by step process where you using the covenant idea and the and the the support you can come up with an action plan then you publish the action plan that's the next step and then you move towards it i know it doesn't uh there there are people who criticize it and it doesn't always um it doesn't always work but i mean it really has got a lot of people involved it's brought a lot of people together and i think the covenant of mayors has been a, a, a and and mayors adapt have been a great success in many ways um uh, with the green city accord the idea is to start 
to see if we could offer that kind of support in other environmental areas. And I see in the list of people who are in this meeting, there are various people who are involved in the, the Green City Accord development. Um, one, of, one of those areas is uh, obviously nature and biodiversity uh, linked to adaptation and climate change, and all sorts of areas we could bring together um, and basically say, if you're making an urban greening plan, I think it should essentially be the same thing as what your action plan and what you would be signing up to within the Green City Accord. So if you did that, you would already be basically have ticked that box on the Green City Accord. And if you've done the Green City Accord, you've essentially developed a, an urban greening plan. Um, that that's my that's my idea. I don't think I think with there's so many initiatives, we've got to stop annoying people and confusing them. Um, so all of these things should actually be one. That's my idea. Yeah, thanks a lot, Benjamin. I just want to remind everyone that the launch event of the Green City Accord will uh, take place on the on Thursday, the 22nd of October, during the European Week of Region and Cities. So perhaps we can take uh, some questions from the chat box. Ingvilde, do you see any questions for Benjamin? I do. Um, we have a question from Alexander Bau from the Bioregion Institute. Uh, he is worried about us running out of time when it comes to saving bi biodiversity. Um, and he is, so his question is, when quotas will come on the map of EU policies, policies to frame and slow down uh, the demise? Yeah, I think you're talking then about, by quotas, I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about the legally binding targets for bio, to for restoring biodiversity and what uh, um, we're, we're going to come forward with our proposal next year. I, th I also worry that it's too late, to be honest. Um, I worry that we're doing too little too late, but I mean, uh, we do. I mean, we do as, as quickly as we can now. We've got the political backing. Um, we're coming forward with a legal target proposals for the for key priority areas, hopefully next year. And we want to have them in place basically as soon as possible after that. Uh, and 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 the nature restoration plan is a, is a longer term 2030 to 2050 setup where we're not just going to try and stop the degrading of ecosystems. We're going to start trying to restore them. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, Benjamin. Uh, any more questions from the chat? Uh, not for now. But okay. everyone feel free to ask questions whenever yeah. you feel like it I, during I'm the... I'm going to be staying for a while so I can uh, answer questions in the chat box. Fantastic. Now there actually came in another one. Um, how does the green infrastructure strategy link to and support the UGPs? God, that, that's... The urban... uh, that's something yeah. where I'm I'm working with um, with colleagues who work on the green infrastructure strategy on that. So we they should link <laughs> very effectively. Obviously, the green infrastructure strategy partly is talking about uh, big connected networks. We need to make sure that that urban areas and peri-urban areas are part of that bigger network. And one of the things that I think has become clear recently is that there's actually, although people often thought or believed that urban areas were uh, places where there was less biodiversity than, than their surroundings, in fact, in many areas, the opposite is the case. Uh, urban areas can be actually havens for biodiversity. They can be places where pollinators are protected uh, and, and then they spread out into surrounding areas. That's partly because of intensive agriculture, um, but really there's a, there's a lot of, of variation uh, in cities. So the green infrastructure strategy has to be connect urban areas together, green corridors, etc. Yeah, and that's, but I'm not the world expert on on the green infrastructure strategy, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, Benjamin. We have another question uh, from the chat that just came in. Um, do you have a mapping, uh, so a protocol or a system that give you mapping and control of biodiversity in real time? So quantity, nature, biomass, etc. If um, so, we are interested to team up. This is again from, from Alexander Bau at the Bioregion Institute. 
Well, we can certainly chat. I don't. I mean, we obviously don't have anything to control biodiversity. A mapping protocol that can control biodiversity that would be that would be amazing. That would be like acting as God. Um, there is a lot of um, a lot of information available on mapping satellite data, centralised, obviously. Um, but at an urban level, obviously, you need we we can highlight different areas in terms of uh, land use type. But biodiversity mapping uh, is done in an, an assessment is done in a local level and, and member state level and gathering. And I, there is there there is a lot of information out there. That's what the mapping of ecosystems and their services policy is about. But um, yeah, this it, it it's a very complicated question. So the the system, there's satellite data, there's lots of information systems, but what we need for, from urban areas is that they make their own biodiversity maps, really, because they need to go into a, a lower level of detail or a higher level of detail. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. In fact, it's making a fantastic transition to the next speakers. If you have any more questions for Benjamin, don't hesitate to write in the chat box. And uh, as Benjamin is staying with us a bit longer, he will, uh, he will, I'm sure, uh, try to answer to, to your question as, as best as he can. Thanks yeah. a lot, Benjamin. We're Thank super you. happy that uh, biodiversity is so high on the Commission's agenda and got you so excited, this new yeah. uh, biodiversity <laughs> strategy. Thanks a lot for your keynote speech. And uh, I would like to to move on to um, our cities now. I would like to give the floor to Paul Molson, who is biologist in the technical and environmental uh, department of the city of Copenhagen. Um, so Paul is going to talk about the new, uh, well, the, the Copenhagen biodiversity strategy and its main pillars. So Paul, floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Louisa. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Maslin. I'm a biologist uh, employed by the municipality of Copenhagen. Uh, I'm going to talk today about how we go about creating and maintaining urban nature in Copenhagen. Um, I appear to have, here we go, so I'm in control of the slides. Um, yes, well, in Copenhagen, we have actually a strategy for how we maintain our urban nature. It's a, a 10 year strategy because it's a fact that Copenhagen is growing. In fact, we expect to have over 100,000 new residents for the next 10 years. But this puts an increasing pressure on our, our natural areas. So we're trying to incorporate biodiversity in every potential aspect of our urban planning. The uh, primary way of doing this in our strategy is to increase biodiversity. And we've looked at how to use biodiversity or incorporate biodiversity over all the various aspects in our urban planning. As Benjamin said before, we've got climate adaptation. At the moment, we have over 300 cloudburst projects in the pipeline in Copenhagen, and this gives potential for a huge synergy to increase biodiversity. Um, a very good example we have just here, if the slide will change. Oh, now I have to go back. Uh, how do we go back, Louisa, do we know? No, anyway, we've already, yes, yeah, there we go. Yeah. We'll try again. No, anyway, there was a picture <laughs> of one of our latest uh, climate adaptation projects where we simply replaced 9,000 square meters of tarmac with over, yeah, almost 600 new trees, over 300 uh, square meters of perennials, uh, and over 30,000 bulbs. Uh, the fascinating thing about this particular system is it uses the latest technology for climate adaptation, which is called First Flush where the first set of rainwater, which comes directly from the roads, is washed into the sewers. And the second flush, which is the actually feeds the plants and beds. So it's quite an interesting system. We've also looked at how we can uh, increase biodiversity in our natural areas, because they all are, after all, areas where biodiversity is almost already at its highest. We're quite lucky in Copenhagen in that we have a fantastic natural area really quite close to the city centre. There's an area called Amarfell. It's over 250 hectares. And if you look just to the left of center in the picture, you can actually see our, our, our town hall clock. So no more than 10 minutes from the city center, we have an area of over 250 hectares of fantastic nature. So we've changed the way we uh, look after this particular area. For example, we've recently introduced a large grazing project where we actually have over 40 hectares where we've released a flock of Scottish Highland cattle 
to basically increase biodiversity because we all know that grazing is a fantastic way of increasing biodiversity. But when that is said, it's not always a good solution in an urban environment because it can sometimes, unfortunately, lead to problems. This is what happens sometimes if people don't have control of their dogs. No, anyway, but the good thing about the grazing is it works. And as well as having the cows, in uh, two weeks time, we're going to release a, a herd of Exmoor ponies. So we're actually going to have an all year mixed grazing uh, potential on the area. We should hopefully lift the biodiversity to a fantastic degree because it works. We were quite lucky that uh, a year after we'd begun the grazing project, we registered the area where the uh, grazers were and we discovered for the first time this fantastic little flower, Orchis militaris, the military orchid. This was actually an orchid which hadn't been seen in Denmark for almost 30 years and that actually exists, exists at the moment, one single example. And I think you'll agree with me, it really is quite a fantastic flower. We've also gone to look at our parks because parks are also a fantastic area where we can increase biodiversity. Before, it used to be the tradition that all the grass was cut 26 times a year. So basically the park were like a snooker table, not exactly good for biodiversity. So we simply changed the maintenance of our parks and we've chosen large areas of our parks where the grass isn't cut on a regular basis, or rather it is cut, but only once or twice a year. We've also looked at the way we look after our trees. Before, it used to be the tradition where if we had to chop down a tree, we chopped it down, we chopped it up, we drove it all away. If at all possible, we don't do that anymore. We'd much rather leave the tree standing as a torso to increase biodiversity, and if at all possible, to leave the material lying in situ, again, for a host for a variety of different organisms. We've also allocated certain area of our parks to volunteer collaboration, because this gives us a possibility to use methods which simply wouldn't be viable in a municipal setting. I'm sure those of you who work with uh, municipal gardeners know how much they love sitting on their lawn mowers, and they're most definitely not going to use a scythe. And this is where volunteers can really help lift an area. Cemeteries. Cemeteries are a huge potential area for increasing biodiversity, maybe an area which hasn't been thought of before. So we've really tried to in incorporate biodiversity into our new planning for our cemetery areas. Uh, a very good example of this is one of our most famous church yards called Assistenz Kierkegaard, which is home to uh, Hans Christian Andersen and Niels Bohr, for example. So last year, when we made a new development plan for how the church yard should be uh, maintained in the future, we'd really try to incorporate projects which would lift the biodiversity. For example, we, uh, like I said before, we don't cut the grass as often. We've set up a variety of different bird species. If we do new planting, we ensure that they're wild native plants that we use. Again, like I said before, if we have to remove a tree, we leave it as a torso and leave as much material as at all possible. And if we plant new trees, we ensure that they're also a food source for the local fauna. Urban development, also a very important thing. This is about basically trying to incorporate biodiversity in new areas or in existing buildings. Here, for example, we have the roof of Risa Akil, which is a fantastic green roof, which is over 7,000 square meters. I'm sure you know if you've worked with green roofs, it's a tradition just to use mosses and lichens, which doesn't particularly increase biodiversity, at least to a lesser degree. And they're also not particularly effective at uh, retaining rainwater. So here, for example, they've used a variety of different plants and the area has also been made available to the public. So we've created a green, a green space in the centre of Copenhagen with increased biodiversity. And also a bonus effect of using the different types of plants means that over 60 to 80 percent of the rainwater which falls in this roof never actually reaches the sewers. Municipal land. We have to be front runners. We're the community. We cannot say to other people, you have to increase biodiversity and not do it ourselves. So, for example, we've made a huge change in some of the ways we uh, maintain some of our areas. And if we have to renovate them again, how we renovate them. It used to be very much the tradition that beside our paths and roads, we had just grass verges. Again, not particularly biodiverse. So where if it's all possible, we started instead making plants, uh, beds of native wild plants again lifting the area both visually and biodiversity. But we can't do it alone. 
So we try to incorporate um, Copenhageners on our projects as well. One thing I'm particularly impressed of in Copenhagen is we've done a very good project over the last few years with so-called green backyards, where, for example, if there are two thirds of the residents in a residential block agree to, sorry, yeah, if two thirds of the residents in a residential block agree to change their backyard, the municipality pays for the planning and the execution of turning the, the former grey area into a green area. And as soon as the project is completed, we give the residents uh, the responsibility for maintaining this area. So again, we get them interested in the whole looking after biodiversity aspect. Trees, as I said, like Benjamin was saying before, a fundamental part of the European biodiversity planning. We actually have plans in Copenhagen to plant over 100,000 new trees before 2025. But that's easier said than done in an urban setting. So you've actually come a long way in Copenhagen by simply creating a new forest. On an area of municipal land in the very south uh, of Copenhagen, we've planted on a 20 hectare area over 25,000 new trees. Uh, the fascinating thing for me about this particular project is it's remarkably not just the classic plantation. And the area consists of different types of forests. We've got an urban forest with rowan or willow, an oak forest, again with oaks or hornbeams or field maple. We have a food forest because everyone likes going out in nature nowadays and collecting food with cherries, hazelnuts, apples, whatever. Then we have a low forest, again, a little bit uh, longer down on the project, with lime, thawed or bird cherry. And last but by no means least, we also have an open forest, for example, with birch or elm. But forests don't appear overnight, as I'm sure you all know. So we've actually been quite, if you ask me, quite clever, because while we're waiting for the trees to develop, we've actually sown thousands upon thousands of wildflowers. And this is one thing that is an absolute joy for Copenhageners. And trust me, Instagram went amok when this first came forward. But again, this also lives by the, uh, lifts biodiversity. We actually registered the area two years after we'd sown all the wildflowers, especially for bees. And there was an incredible variety of bees. Just to show you a couple of examples, some of the more uh, rare examples, we discovered um, up in the left-hand corner, you can see the yellow-faced uh, reed bee, which is quite interesting, makes its nest in reeds. In the top right, you can see the spotted dark bee. Again, quite interesting. This is actually a, a kleptoparasite, or another type of bee called the lesser welted male bee. And interestingly enough, we only found a single example of the lesser welted mason bee, but a strong population of the spotted dark bee. So we know the mason bees are out there somewhere. And last, but by no means least, my own personal favorite, Hoplomosia spinulosa. I'm afraid it doesn't have an English name. And the interesting thing about this is it actually makes its nests in old snail shells. Now, we carry on because last, but by no means least, we have to remember, or not last, we have to remember that we do live in a city and not everybody is interested in these green biodiverse areas as biologists like myself. So uh, I'm afraid I can only see Louisa now on my picture, but I can presume I can carry on regardless, although Louise is very nice to look at. There we go. Thank you. Um, we have to remember that we live in a city, so we have to try and incorporate biodiversity in an urban setting. And we could do this, for example, with our so-called pocket parks. Here is a little park in an area called Nerpol in Copenhagen, a very yeah, concrete, could one say, uh, urban residential area. So we've tried to make a little biodiverse project in the centre of this uh, concrete jungle, which fits in with the, respect with the surrounding areas. And last, when no means least, we've looked at our water. We're quite lucky in Copenhagen that the water quality in our harbour has increased dramatically over the last few years, both a result of declining industrial use, but also with increased technology and management of our sewer systems. So to encourage biodiversity in our, in our saltwater areas, we have, for example, created a series of artificial reefs to encourage uh, both, both fish and plants in the water, and it works. Uh, for example, apart from the classic ubiquitous species, ubiquitous species you can see in Copenhagen uh, Harbour, it's now actually possible to observe sea trout, sculpin and garfish 
which I think is great to have in the middle of a city centre. We've also looked at our freshwater areas. Here, for example, is the largest freshwater area we have in Copenhagen, an area called Udesdu Morza. Now, this area in the past really suffered under the sins of uh, previous generations, and it's incredibly polluted by, for example, phosphorus and nitrogen because of sewage runoff. In fact, the problem was so bad that if you look to the, 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 the channel we have on the left hand side, which feeds the freshwater area, this was actually declared biologically dead in the 1970s. So within the last month, we've started a project where we're actually going to remove over 40,000 cubic metres of sewage from the bottom of this canal, and by that way, hopefully lift up the area so it's clean water, and that way also increase biodiversity. We also have yet another strategy called Space for Nature, a strategy for biodiversity. And this is more of a, whereas the first strategy was more of a, what should we say, a guiding principle. Down in our, in our, in our space for nature, we're talking about the real nitty gritty. We're talking concrete examples of geographical areas or species, which we try and help, again, the lift and, and to incorporate our responsibility for biodiversity. We have, for example, recently made a whole new series of amphibian ponds in one of our large natural areas because we're lucky enough in Copenhagen to have two Appendix 4 species, uh, the Great Crested Newt and the Moor Frog. So by creating a series of ponds, we're trying to increase the populations of these. And we've also created a series of bird islands because many of our natural areas have intact with Copenhagen has grown, turned into residential areas. Of course, with a, as an area becomes residential, you have dogs, you have cats, you have rats. And this is a large, pro large problem for our water bird population. So we've created a series of fake islands to give these birds a refugium in the heart of a residential area. We're particularly pleased with the uh, results we've had for this, the black-headed gull. Um, this, for example, was a species which in the 1970s, on the area where we've made these islands, could be found in over 20,000 examples, as a 20,000 pairs. That number had declined to only 3,000 breeding pairs over the last few years. But as a direct result of our making these bird islands, that population has doubled in the last 18 months. And you can also get a bonus effect by doing uh, projects for the black-headed gull. For example, with the Caspian tern, which actually makes its nest inside the colonies of the black-headed gull. So you've seen an increase in a variety of species just by helping one particular species. And last but by no means least, we've also started a major campaign against invasive species. Uh, we just quickly popped past the giant hogweed where we've had great results. Uh, the uh, population of this is now down to only 10% of it was uh, no more than five years ago. We've also started a major campaign against Japanese knotweed. Uh, we combat this in a variety of ways because we're actually a municipality which refuses to use uh, pesticides. So we combat Japanese knotweed sometimes either by cutting it or by covering it or by digging it up or if at all possible we've started another project where I actually use Icelandic sheep to eat Japanese knotweed and trust me they're some great workers they work 24 hours a day 365 days a year. Thanks a lot, Paul. Perhaps uh, some a concluding remark on your side? Yep, quickly. Um, I'd just like to say, I said, we've done a, a variety of uh, projects. I said, this last week's really goldenrod. And the best thing is, we can see it works. So we hope, hope, hope we can carry on with some of these projects. And who knows, maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, we can really say that Copenhagen is a biodiverse city. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Paul. It was like traveling this morning, thanks to your beautiful pictures. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have mentioned uh, some of the difficulties to implement the biodiversity strategy in Copenhagen. So perhaps in two words, what are, according to you, the main threats to biodiversity in your city? Uh, personally, I think most definitely the invasive species, uh, because they are spreading at an alarming rate, especially Japanese knotweed. And the good thing about the invasive species is it's an area where we can make a difference in a remarkably short period of time. So that, for example, for me, is a very, very uh, important aspect. And the second thing, of course, is habitat loss. Like I said, Copenhagen is growing. So it's very important that we look after the areas we have 
and make sure that we maintain biodiversity in those particular areas. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Pleasure. Now I would like to pass the floor to Gunia Hoot, ecologist at the Environment and Health Department of the City of Stockholm, who will present the brand new Stockholm Action Plan for Biodiversity. Gunia, I don't know if you share the same uh, view as uh, Paul when it comes to the main threat to uh, biodiversity in Stockholm, but the uh, floor is yours. Please uh, present us your new brand, uh, your new uh, strategy. Yes. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Gunilla Jort and I work at the Environment and Health Administration of Stockholm, the city of Stockholm. And I'm an ecologist, a biologist, just as Paul. And uh, uh, I see if I can have the control about of my slides here. Uh, I, yes. Uh, I'm going to talk about an action plan for biodiversity that we are uh, producing right now in Stockholm. Uh, we have a mandate from the from the city council in the last year's budget that says the following. The city needs to take responsibility for monitoring and maintaining biodiversity. We want a strategy to develop the city's biodiversity so that the city together with its residents property owners and administrations can contribute to developing the green infrastructure. So that's in a nutshell what we have to do. So we have been working with this ever since, ever since last year. And uh, why do we need a biodiversity action plan in Stockholm? Well, of course, it gets us better conditions for, for long term protection and uh, uh, development of Stockholm's biodiversity, and this is a this is the case for both the residential areas and the, the the natural areas, which we have a lot of actually. And at the same time, the city of Stockholm is growing very fast. We need to build 140,000 apartments until 2030, starting to count at at, uh, 20, at 2010. So we have a lot of work to do trying to uh, see how we can protect and even enhance biodiversity at the same time as the city is growing as this, at this accelerated rate. Um, in our action plan, we are looking a lot towards the global uh, sustainability development goals. And uh, most of all, three of the goals we see are relevant for, for our own action plans. And it's uh, number 11, the sustainable cities and communities. We have a lot of urban areas, of course, in our city. But uh, perhaps most of all, the, the goal number 15 and number 14, which uh, treats the, the issue of biodiversity on land and under the water surface. So uh, this action plan means that we need to have a strategic approach. Uh, we need to analyze uh, what are the needs and, uh, of the city and, and which are the conditions, the special conditions we have in Stockholm, and to suggest methods to, to achieve this. We need better tools to, to make it easier to pay attention to biodiversity in the city's different work processes. And this is a very important aspect. So I'm going to talk about more, talk about this a bit more. And uh, we need to apply the general guidelines we have in, in some parent documents, one of them being the, the, the city plan for development and another being the environmental program that we have where we talk about uh, the, the goals, the environmental goals for biodiversity in general. So we need to specify them more to, to see what we actually can do in reality. And uh, uh, we also need a strategy for our communication, both internal communication within the, the administrations of the city. We have a lot of different offices and administrations within the city and, and we need to work together to achieve this, but also, of course, our contacts with the, with the inhabitants of Stockholm need to, to improve. And also other external stakeholders, such as companies, etc. 
And uh, within this uh, action plan, we're talking about five principal strategies. The first one is to highlight the, some target species and uh, some priority nature qualities or biotopes, if you like. Uh, so we have tried to prioritize certain certain aspects of the biodiversity in Stockholm to, to work even harder with these. And uh, the second strategy, very important, is to pay attention to biodiversity in the city's different processes. The third one is to uh, implement some actual measures. Much of the things that Paul were talking about was talking about uh, we also do in Stockholm, but we are in the beginning of this process, so uh, we need to plan these measures and, and then carry them out. And it's a lot about uh, ecological res restoration. Rest the fourth strategy has to do with the communication. We need to develop both the, the communication within the city and to, towards the inhabitants, but also develop the knowledge with education, etc., of how to manage the best way our nature. And uh, the fifth strategy uh, is about developing tools that can facilitate this collaboration and the implementation of our goals. Uh, so the action plan also addresses some other areas such uh, in, in which we see a need of, of better knowledge. And one of these are the, the invasive species. We are in the beginning, actually, of, of how to treat and manage the threat from invasive species. And also how to improve and the networking. And uh, of course, how we can actually execute these things, how implementation can be done. Uh, I don't know if this works. I'm trying to shift, yeah. Uh, the first strategy, highlight target species and, and, and priority to nature qualities. It also ties in with uh, th at least three of the, of the targets of the global uh, sustainability goals. Uh, so we have in, in Stockholm some special uh, types of nature which are very rich in biodiversity. For example, the oak plants and also we have a lot of water and shorelines. Uh, we have meadows. We have a lot of cultural landscape. We have old growth trees, most of all pine trees, except for the oaks and, and the deciduous trees. So all these types of nature we, we try to prioritize in our management and protection conservation efforts. Uh, in general, Stockholm can be called a green capital. Uh, as you see here uh, is a, a map of the region of Stockholm and here you can see the so-called green wedges. Uh, that, those are parts of nature that are still more or less intact uh, that uh, goes into the city. You can see here the outline of our municipality, the city of Stockholm. And, and so some of these great regional green wedges are, are cutting through uh, Stockholm as well. So that, mean, that means we, we still have a lot of nature. So you can see here in, the, uh, in this diagram, we, we still have uh, uh, more than half of the city is water or some kind of, of, of uh, natural or semi-natural land. So the developed land is about 45% in Stockholm. Um, this gives us uh, good conditions to work with a, a green infrastructure or blue green infrastructure as we call it in Stockholm because we do have a lot of water. We have the Lake Malaren that uh, has its outflow in, in the sea, in the Baltic Sea here. Uh, so we have tried to map our, our green infra, our blue green infrastructure in Stockholm and, and see where do we have core areas? Where do we have dispersal zones between the core areas? Uh, we do have 11 protected areas in Stockholm, and uh, these are parts of, of this green infrastructure, of course, uh, the core areas. Uh, but we also need to see to how they are connected together, because species need to, dis to disperse, they need to spread 
from one point to another. If we can't achieve that, it's going to be difficult to, to maintain biodiversity for the future. So this green, blue-green infrastructure is very important in our, uh, in our action plan. We have a lot of beaches, lakes, creeks and shores in Stockholm. So we have to see to that. It's not only a, an issue of preserving them, which it of course is, but it's also an issue of, of how to manage them uh, to, to enhance the biodiversity. We have a, still some open landscape, some open grasslands in, in Stockholm, even if it's on many of them, but there are still some, some great air, open areas. And uh, they are rests of, of the culture, agricultural landscape that we have. So we need to try to manage them uh, in a way that can uh, restore them and, and maybe substitute what's, what what's once was, was the agricultural landscape with man, modern management methods that, that, that can be similar to this so that we can uh, protect and enhance the, the, the biodiversity connected to those types of, of, of areas. And uh, we also have the woodland. As I said, it's very cultural. Uh, in, in Stockholm, we have these oak trees that are big because they have been uh, uh, dwelling in an open landscape. They have grown big. And we need to see to the future that these great oak trees will also be, we, we also will have old oak trees in future. Same, same thing with the pine trees and the deciduous forest. Uh, but of course, we have the residential nature, a lot of it in Stockholm. We have allotments where people can cultivate uh, flowers and fruit trees and so on. That can be very important for for certain kinds of, of biodiversity. And of course, the nature is very important as a recreation resort for, for the, the inhabit inhabitants of our city. Uh, speaking of these target species that we have selected for uh, special conservation efforts, uh, we have the, the amphibians uh, represented by the crested newt that is uh, protected by EU law and uh, we work a lot with this with these species. We also have some, some other species, some plants and uh, pollinators and uh, and birds of prey that we have selected to, to symbolize uh, uh, the rest of the biodiversity. It's good to focus on something uh, uh, so at the same time we, we can protect a lot of other species that, that are uh, living in the same kind of environment as those. So the actions to promote these species will often have a wider positive benefit to the biodiversity in general. Um, here are some examples of, of the species that, that we have selected. So it's of course the old oaks and the old pine trees, but also some urban species, the common swift, the madwort, species that grow within the urban areas that we can uh, make uh, better, we can try to enhance the, the, the conditions for, for these species by putting up nest boxes, etc. We have some typical woodland species. Uh, if we manage to protect them, we, we can also see that, that, that we have uh, uh, protected these kinds of woodlands and the connectivity between them. The same thing with grassland species. And uh, uh, also some other groups of species, bats, bees and pollinators, birds of prey, amphibians, fish, dragonflies. We try to, to have these representing a, a broader biodiversity. And uh, I'm going to go into the, the second strategy, which is very important, I think, to remember that if we are going to, to achieve these things, this announcement of biodiversity, we need to work together within the whole city. So we need to, to have biodiversity up on the agenda, not only uh, among the people who are already working with, with the green spaces, but other, other administrations as well, other processes as well. The city planning is very, very important, but also the investments made in the green spa spaces 
the management of nature, which in Stockholm is, is divided on, on, on many different administrations. We need to work together to, to improve the management, to, to make it more adapted to, to biodiversity. We need to work with, with the biodiversity when we work with water quality and monitoring, of course. Monitoring of biodiversity is important and the supervision of our already existing protected areas uh, as well as, as the coming ones. We are planning to protect more nature in Stockholm. And we're also looking into, beginning to look into the city's purchase of, of food and other products. We are already doing that in, in the sense of, of climate mitigation. But uh, the issue of biodiversity needs to be to, to be uh, looked more closely at when, when we buy products. So that's an important new goal. Then the third strategy, implementing the measures of ecological reinforcement, as we call it, or restoration, maybe a better word. And uh, that means measures that favor those uh, different kinds of nature I, main, I, I mentioned. Uh, the coarse trees, the contiguous forest and dead wood, uh, especially oaks, all the coniferous forest, measure that increase, measures that increase uh, the, the connectivity within the green infrastructure. Those are very important. So in the weaker parts of the green infrastructure, we need to strengthen those parts, maybe by planting trees, maybe by, by uh, managing better the, the existing nature there. And, and so on. And uh, measures to increase the species diversity in grasslands. Uh, Paul talked about the, the flower beds and, and uh, we work a lot of, with that as well. And the management methods of me meadows and uh, grazing and so on. We can do a lot more in this area. And uh, also some measures to strengthen beaches and shores as habitants. Uh, both uh, uh, on the land side and, and underwater. We need to look more into the possibilities to make underwater reefs and, and things like that to, to investigate further how the biodiversity looks in our shores. So uh, our first step in this is to analyze the changes in the blue-green infrastructure and see where it needs to be reinforced. Uh, we, we still have most of our green infrastructure intact, but some weak links have been affected more than others and we need to strengthen them. And uh, we need to protect the connectivity between the, these core areas. Um, they have some so concluding the, remarks, Guinea. Sorry? They have some concluding remarks on uh, your site. Just that that uh, the, the green infrastructure is is uh, one of the most important aspects that we have to 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 protect for the future. Uh, I, I'm only going to say that uh, in this uh, process of of taking of, of uh, producing our action plan, we have have a, had a lot of different workshops and roundtable discussion. We have a, had a lot of interactions both within the city and, and uh, with organizations, NGOs and so on. And uh, we are now in the process of uh, a referral to internal and external stakeholders. And hopefully uh, the next stop will be the decision of the City Council of this uh, uh, action plan in November this year. So uh, that's what we are looking forward to. And uh, we have also already quick started the implementation of, of this uh, action plan. So we are already in this year starting to, to plan uh, measures, physical mes measures to, to enhance the biodiversity. So this is very hopeful at the moment. Uh, we are in the start of a process, but we have a lot to do in the coming years. Fantastic. 
Thanks a lot, Guinea, for your presentation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you, our travel across uh, Nordic landscapes are, is going on, is continuing. Uh, yeah. I will uh, quickly ask you a question. You mentioned that it's very important that the strategy is embedded in the city planning, the city yes. urban planning. So um, I understand that in Stockholm, you are trying to mainstream biodiversity across all other policy areas, which is also what Eurocities is advocating at EU level. Mm -hmm. What is, according to best obstacle to this mainstreaming of biodiversity in the Stockholm municipality? Well, uh, the, the 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 most important thing I I, I think is is to uh, that that biodiversity has to be on the agenda uh, in every process. We need to uh, apply a, a holistic approach uh, for that is needed for for healthy biodiversity, and that I think ties nicely into the EU uh, Green Deal. Uh, to reach our goals in the city, we need an ambitious EU policy framework uh, to lean on. And, and that's not just about biodiversity, it's also about other legislation, like the chemicals legislation, air quality, water legislation, and, and agriculture policy, and so on. So, so of course, we, we need a, 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 a good framework for our own actions. And uh, all these areas are regulated at EU level, and all of them have a, a direct impact on biodiversity in in our city uh, as well as in the rest of Europe. And uh, so we think that uh, just as as we try to uh, take biodiversity into account within the the city's different processes, the same thing applies to on an EU level. We need to, to take this into account in, in every policy, Fantastic. many policies. Fantastic. And I think that's the only way it can be really successful. It, it's that we actually apply it, not just talk, but action. Indeed, fully agree with that. Thanks a lot, Guinea. If you have any questions for Guinea, please write them down in the chat box and we'll take them during the, the Q&A session. Uh, at the end of all presentations. Thanks a lot, Guinea, again. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Karin Erzberg, who is Special Advisor for International Co Climate Cooperation for the City of Oslo. Uh, slightly the scope of our discussion and explain how Oslo uses uh, urban green and blue infrastructure to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Louise, um, and I hope that my slides will appear uh, soon for you as well. So um, I am the International Climate Coordinator for the City of Oslo, and um, I will give an overview of how we're working to achieve our climate goals uh, and implementing our climate strategy and how that integrates nature-based solutions and biodiversity protection. So it's more of a combination of several issues. Trying. Yes, there we go. So we all know, I think, um, that cities are really the key for uh, a sustainable future globally. What happens in our cities and how we develop, build and manage housing, transportation, business and everyday life will be decisive for both how the world manages to stop dangerous climate change, but also for biodiversity. Um, most people already live in cities, and this is um, going to increase in the future. So Oslo already has a climate strategy, and uh, I'd like to say uh, at the start that we're also in the process of developing an action plan on biodiversity, building on a framework from 2015. Now, our Climate strategy was adopted by the City Council in May this year. Uh, we have very high ambitions, aiming to become a zero emission city and be climate resilient. So for 2030, the target for emission reductions is to reduce by 95%. And we will also be climate resilient. To be able to do this, we need to integrate climate change into all decision making. I'd also like to say that our climate strategy is not just about count, counting tons of carbon, building resilience, it's about upgrading Oslo to be a better city to live in. 
We have a governing tool in the form of a climate budget to track this, uh, which specifies the short-term emissions goals and identifies measures and who is uh, responsible for implementation. The climate strategy has five um, targets, five sectoral or um, sub-targets, as well as 16 priority areas. And also climate adaptation plan is integrated into this. Now to, uh, to talk more about this uh, in terms of how it also is important for biodiversity, I will focus uh, on some issues, not all of them. One of the priority areas is to protect and increase the natural capture of CO2 through better, more sustainable forest management, as well as uh, managing the green spaces. Uh, protection of forests will not only ensure that we store natural carbon, but will also um, protect biodiversity and enhance climate resilience. And I think Oslo is really one of the first cities to include the climate benefits of forests into a climate strategy. And we'll, I'll come back to the role of the forest in, in that regard. Um, but first say a little bit about the impacts of climate change in Oslo. Oslo is quite far north, so climate change is happening faster and is, is to a higher degree. Uh, it's becoming warmer, the summer is longer and the winter is shorter. And we have more extreme weather in particular in terms of heavy rainfall. Now the background picture is really of the city of Oslo, which is shaped like an amphitheater towards the fjord. It's surrounded by forest. It's a beautiful setting, but it gives us challenges in particular with handling large rainfall events. More um, on the climate change impacts in Oslo. So the higher temperatures uh, means that we will have um, higher frequencies of heat waves. We can have a heat island effect in the city. Um, heat waves and drought increases the risk of forest fires. And I, I could add to this that since Oslo is quite far north, um, temperatures at 30 degrees um, are very unusual. The definition of a heat wave in Oslo is a maximum temperature of 25 degrees or more for more than three days in a row. And that doesn't sound like a lot to many other places, but we're not used to it in Oslo. We don't have air conditioners in the houses, so the heat waves we're talking about at this level is a challenge, particularly to a vulnerable population. The extreme precipitation that we're expecting um, is is um, a major challenge. So this would be a single extreme rainfall events that uh, gives us problems with managing the surface water. We can get urban flooding. Uh, the picture here is actually from the main, main um, avenue, the main street in Oslo. And the fact that we have steep hills can increase this problem. Um, and also results in landslides, mud slides or rock falls. Now, a little bit about biodiversity, uh, sort of overarching how we look at uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. We have worked on this for a long time, um, having had a program for city ecology as far back as 2011. Uh, we are now working on an updated plan for uh, biodiversity protection based on mapping native types and registering rare and endangered species, integrating this mapping into how we do our spatial planning, establishing green corridors, parks and meadows, and also in forest management. Ecosystem services is one of the main um, principles behind how we work on biodiversity and city planning. Now on to how this is linked to uh, climate change and climate adaptation. Uh, two of the main linkages to between biodiversity and climate change is uh, first of all to protect the blue and green areas 
it's uh, I think very similar to what Gunilla just told us about from Stockholm. Protecting the forest, um, protecting key native types, including large trees, establish new green areas and reopening waterways. This also contributes uh, in major ways to enhance climate resilience. Second one is to, to build a climate friendly compact city. And that is uh, the, the most important aspect of that is uh, related to spatial planning. Um, do the spatial planning in a way that both reduces transport and, and introduces climate friendly technologies and solutions, but also preserves uh, natural ecosystems. So we have specific climate criteria to uh, make sure that this is done and um, that we do build a climate friendly city. I'll say now a little bit about the forest and then about the water management as the two most um, important areas that, that link biodiversity and climate change. So Oslo is surrounded by forest. In fact, within our borders, it's mostly forest. 68% is called Marka, which is natural areas and forest areas. It captures rainwater it, and through that regulates floods and regulates temperature. We would have uh, would expect larger problems with heat if it wasn't for the Marka area surrounding the city. It's a very important area for recreation uh, used by more than a million people and it's protected by law. So Oslo is one municipality, but there are really um, seven municipalities that border to this large forest area. And the law really ensures that we do not run the risk of a piece by piece fragmentation, for instance, that could uh, reduce both the biodiversity as well as the role of the forest area for climate resilience. The market area forms a large natural buffer against floods and landslides. Uh, there is a right to roam, so there's free access for everyone. Um, and it's a, a very important part of our climate strategy. Uh, one side is the protection of forests and uh, woodlands um, and moors, but we also have uh, started an active program to restore moors and wetlands because they're important carbon storage sites, as well as important for biodiversity. The forest management plan uh, is, is based on following a natural forest dynamics as much as possible, which over time will give a varied and multi-layered forest as opposed to um, a sort of clear cutting uh, side uh, type of practice. Some of the forest is owned by the municipality, some is private owned, and there are also areas that have uh, protection in terms of being nature reserves. So it's a mosaic of different practices. On to the waterways. Um, also has a number of streams and rivers going from the forest down to the sea. Uh, most of these were, were closed earlier on um, and we're working to reopen them. Uh, the rivers are of course very important in terms of handling rainfall, flooding, snowmelt floods. Um, in our process of reopening waterways, we are taking care to place them in their historic run and also to restore the riverbank uh, ecosystems, uh, creating green corridors basically from the forest to the sea. Now I'm um, uh, saying a little bit more about the climate resilience part of how we manage the waterways. So there are three steps in management of the surface water to capture and filter uh, water, which happens a lot in the forest area. Delay and dilute um, the run of water, and which is done through a number of other types of measures, uh, more active um, management, and then ensuring safe flood lines, which is really where opening of the waterways is important. So the so oh, um, I was too fast. 
The local stormwater management is about decreasing, decreasing flood risk, but also about improve, uh, increasing biodiversity and improving aesthetics. So it's part of our city planning uh, to, to build a better and more livable city. More specific measures are such as rain gardens, which are put in place, um, especially when new projects are being planned. Uh, so when new building or infrastructures are considered the blue-green factor and considering how surface water can be used as a resource, for instance, uh, by building rain gardens. This can both improve the, the aesthetic environment as well as um, improving biodiversity, for instance, by choosing plants that are, are attractive to pollinators. A second um, approach that we're doing, uh, looking at, working on is, is green roofs, which can absorb rainwater, store CO2, um, help in improving air quality. We haven't done very much in terms of green roofs yet. Um, it's, so it's, it's at a very small scale. And we have a challenge in that, that green roofs in Oslo must also be able to handle frost and snowfall. Parks and green areas um, are also important within the city. This is not the surrounding forest, but within the city. Uh, we are, uh, we both have parks and we're working to restore and re-establish green areas that uh, have a natural character and uh, can be used for recreation as well as being important for, uh, for retention of rainwater. Biodiversity in Oslo, uh, just to say a little bit about the basis that we're working on now. Oslo is a very biodiverse city. We have a high number of registered species as well, as including red listed species. We also have a high number of invasive species. Um, so it's, it's a challenge to manage all of this. Uh, the main tool is really to uh, use the nature map, the mapping of nature types and species that we have come a far uh, way with already and use that in our spatial planning, as well as now through the action plan that we're working on, look at more specific measures. We are also working uh, to establish or re-establish natural meadows and urban hay fields. So the natural meadows can be uh, in the urban environment, uh, creating corridors and refuges in what could otherwise be uh, a hostile area for many species. Um, when we establish the urban meadows, we are using indigenous plants and uh, we are trying to reconnect uh, pockets of nature that would otherwise be lost. And of course, this requires a, a conscious effort in city development and city planning. We are um, trying to move from becoming an even better and uh, greener and more livable city. We have achieved a lot. The pictures on the left, which are quite old, it's fair to say, but they do show that Oslo used to be much more this is the center of Oslo, this is the city uh, hall, uh, used to be much more dominated by cars, traffic, concrete. Uh, we are gradually rebuilding green areas in the city center. We're working to establish the harbor and the uh, seaside area for areas of recreation and activity, um, as well as what we're doing in the parks and the green corridors and uh, in, in the surrounding forest. So the way forward now, just to sum up what would be um, a message from us from the climate change perspective to, to, to really work hard in, in making sure that climate policy is about making the city a better, not, not sort of um, specific, not only about reducing emissions, preventing loss and damage and increasing resilience, 
we're trying to do this in, in a way that gives us more qualities. Nature-based solutions are very important in this work, um, in particular for, for us in terms of regulating and uh, rainwater um, consequences, reducing damages, uh, improving water and air quality, as well as improving the quality of life through recreation, through learning. Especially now, during the various corona lockdown periods, we see that Lots of people in Oslo use the forests and the parks even more. All, all the urban hipsters are now out on nature walks, um, as well as, well, basically everyone. So we see how important it is for, for our quality of life. Um, we also see through some of the newer projects that we have put in place that, that how effective and, and um, um, well, how effective nature based solutions are in terms of climate change adaptation, better than than the sort of hard uh, infrastructure solutions uh, in, in many ways. Um, losing the forest and the green areas would give us um, very high costs, a lot of other kinds of problems. And so we're very concerned about not losing them, but also improving them and rebuilding. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karin. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed, for highlighting in your last slide uh, so well how much the co-benefits of natural-based solutions are important for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Thanks a lot. I've got a, a question for you quite quickly. Um, as we are talking about the European Green Deal today, how do you think that the strategy of Oslo is contributing to the, to the Green Deal objectives? I think uh, we are contribu contributing in, in a number of ways. Um, one of them is um, how we're planning the city in terms of, uh, of putting a lot of effort into planning a city that is livable, where you can walk, bike, get around by public transport, uh, where you can use the natural environment uh, as, as a way to become more green that these are easy and effective solutions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Karin. If you have any question for Karin, don't hesitate to write uh, it down in the in the chat box and we will take uh, all of them together during the Q&A session. Once again, thanks, uh, Karin, for your for your presentation. And I would like now to move to uh, Leona Silberstein from the city of Helsinki, who will present the Helsinki Roadmap for Circular and Sharing Economy. As Benjamin has said in his keynote speech, uh, biodiversity, circular economy and climate are so closely interlinked. And Leona will explain us uh, how using fewer uh, virgin resources can also help mitigating um, climate change. So Leona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Louise. Um, I'm just trying to show my first slide here. Yes, it's very oh, yeah, bad. here we are. OK, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Leona Silberstein. I come from the city of Helsinki. I work with circular economy in the environmental department. And uh, first of all, I have to thank you all for the beautiful presentations. It's very interesting to listen to. to it's very interesting information for somebody who's not working with those issues and, and the pictures were beautiful. Unfortunately, my presentation doesn't include that many pictures, but I hope you'll bear with me anyway. Um, I have to confirm what Karin just told you about uh, uh, climate change and how it shows very clearly in the Nordic countries. Um, last year, for example, here in the southern Finland, we didn't have any snow at all. Uh, the, the, the northern Finland, they had a lot of snow, but we didn't have any snow, and that's not normal uh, for Finland. Um, I'm over 40 years old and I've seen a few winters already, but I've never seen anything like that. So I have to say that it, it's it's scary. Um, so that brings me to the background of our roadmap. Um, it's based on the Carbon Neutral Helsinki 2035 Action Plan, which was uh, approved in December 2018. It includes uh, a total of 147 actions, uh, which are mostly focusing on 
um, energy efficiency, uh, the use of renewable energy resources in, in traffic, uh, housing and, and town planning. Circular economy is not very thoroughly included in the action plan and that's probably why it has a separate action about uh, creating a roadmap for circular and, share, and sharing economy for the city of Helsinki. So um, we have been working with the roadmap for the whole of last year actually. It was approved, uh, completed and approved last May. It has four focus areas, construction, procurement, green waste and sharing economy and new business opportunities in circular economy. I'm going to go into them a, a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, the time span in the roadmap is similar to the, the carbon neutral Helsinki action plan. It's uh, to 2035. We have defined uh, a focus uh, um, goals for all of the focus areas where we want to be in the year 2035 in terms of circular economy. And we are going to advance step by step through interim goals every five years. Uh, the roadmap now includes 31 concrete actions to support the goals and the actions are now set uh, five years later. This is because circular economy is kind of at the moment. There's new legislation all the time, new technology and ways of operation. We don't know how the world looks like in 15 years. So that's why we have kind of created the, the concrete actions for five years forward and then we'll have a checkup where we are at the moment in 2025 and then we will update the roadmap with uh, new actions. Um, I'm going to show you some of the uh, goals and actions what we have in the roadmap. Uh, one of the focus areas was uh, construction. Now usually when we talk about construction we and, and climate we talk about energy use and energy efficiency because warming of houses is uh, probably one of the biggest sources of uh, GHG emissions. So we should be doing that and we should be working with those things. But uh, construction is also one of the biggest uses of materials globally. And extraction, production, use of materials also produces a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which we shouldn't be ignoring. Now we build a lot in Helsinki. City. People are moving in all the time, so we're building new buildings, we are demolishing the old ones and we're renovating all the time. So it was very clear to us that construction needs to be a focus area in our roadmap. We have a goal that in 2035 we will be implementing carbon neutral circular economy in land use and construction. So this means an economy where natural resources are used sparingly and the life cycle carbon footprint is small. Here you can see a couple of uh, examples of what kind of actions we have in the roadmap for construction. Unfortunately, we're still in the beginning. We don't know how to build circular, so we have to start by piloting. We're going to do uh, different kinds of pi construction pilots where we're trying to test different kinds of circular criteria and solutions for the projects. And to make sure that the pilots won't just remain pilots, we need to take the good learnings and the good solutions and implement them in our daily operations. So the circular economy will, will gradually be a part of our construction processes. Um, both the European and the uh, European Commission's new circular economy action plan highlight the role of uh, public procurements in driving sustainable development forward. And um, I have to agree with this. Um, in Helsinki, we make procurements for worth more than 2 billion euros every year. That's about 40% of our total expenditure. So we're talking about huge material streams and money. Our goal is for the year 2035 to have as key principles in our own procurements that we will be using virgin resources sparingly and preventing waste production. Here are some, some examples of actions. Now, besides construction materials, I would say one of the biggest, if not the biggest product groups we have in the city are furniture. They are used everywhere in every unit we need them. We usually buy them new, 
but at the end of the day, when we stop using them, they won't circulate forward. They end up standing in a storage house somewhere, or at the worst case, they end up being waste. So we're wasting a lot of natural resources here and a lot of money. So Helsinki has established its own uh, recycling website for furniture, where different city units can circulate used furniture with each other. Now we're taking this a bit further. Our aim is to have as a guide uh, a key principle that whenever we buy new furniture, we will primarily look for them from the recycling website. If we don't find them that way, then we will uh, examine the possibilities to buy furniture secondhand or through renting or as a service. Our own procurement strategy is being updated at the moment, so this policy will be included in the strategy. Now, another thing when we talk about circular economy and procurement, we often bump into the, the notion of um, a, a product as a service. This means that in, instead of buying a product, we'll buy the use of the product by leasing it or some other way. Uh, the background thought here is that when the product remains in the ownership of the uh, service provider, they have a bigger interest in uh, offering quality products to the customer, in maintaining and servicing the products so that the lifetime of the product will be longer. Here in Helsinki, we don't have much experience in, in service procurements, but we have a lot of different attitudes toward it. So that's why we wanted to have this in, a, in, in the roadmap and start kind of researching into this issue a bit further and then making our decisions based on the knowledge we get. Here's an example of what we have trying, uh, what we have started already. We have a, a student from the Helsinki University, he's doing his master's thesis for us regarding the city's ICT equipment um, procurement. He will investigate through interviews how the current uh, procurement model is functioning, what kind of challenges we have there. And he will also research into alternative procurement models, what kind of product as a service model there are out there, how they are working, and he will compare the life cycle impacts of these models. Now, the results of his work will be used next year when we, we, will, we are actually renewing our general agreement in our ICT uh, equipment. Um, one focus area in our roadmap is a uh, sharing economy and, and uh, the business opportunities in circular economy. Now, if we want to, and we want to move to circular economy, this means that we have to start thinking and operating in a whole new way. This means new ways of collaboration and a lot more collaboration. This is something we have tried to adopt through our roadmap. Uh, one way for a city to, to collaborate is uh, to be an enabler, to create the right kind of conditions for different circular and bioeconomy companies to operate. This is something we have already started to do. We are participating in a project called CIRCVO together with uh, three other Finnish cities. Uh, this project is promoting the utilization of uh, large volume industrial side streams and earth masses. And Helsinki is concentrating on biological streams. Now, we are uh, creating an operating model for the city, how we could better um, um, communicate and facilitate the, the creation of different kinds of ecosystems and um, uh, a symbiosis of uh, bio and circular economy uh, actors. We are also looking into physical actual spaces and areas in the city could, which could work as a um, platform for this kind of ecosystems. So we're doing very much work with our town planners. We are cooperating with uh, different companies and other regional actors in the area through workshops, seminars, interviews and study visits. This was really a surface scratch into our roadmap. You are welcome to read more about it. I think I included a link to the roadmap. I'm not sure if it's working, but you can contact me later if you, if you want to have the roadmap. So, I would like to say a few words about how we are monitoring uh, the progress of the roadmap. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned the Carbon Neutral Helsinki Action Plan with its 147 actions. 
uh, our climate people who were working with the action plan, they have also created a monitoring tool, which is called Helsinki Climate Watch. Now, this is an open website. You can, anybody can just Google it and go have a look at it. All the 147 actions are in the Climate Watch. Every action has its own page. The page includes a description about the action, what the action is about, what are the goals of its action, um, what are the responsible parties in promoting the action, who are the contact people who you can contact and ask further. There is also always a list of concrete scheduled steps with which the, the responsible parties are actually taking the action forward and it's being updated all the time. So, so this is how we can in real time follow how the action plan is actually going forward. Now we are building a, a similar identical monitoring tool for the roadmap for circular and sharing economy. It's not published yet because we're still working on it, but we aim to publish it by the end of this year or, or at the latest in the beginning of next year. So then we will be able to follow how our circular economy work is also progressing. Um, we also do yearly environmental reporting to our town uh, city government. Uh, so in, in the future, the progress of the roadmap will also be reported in our environmental reporting. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lena. Thanks a lot for your for your presentation. Um, it's, I find circular economy very, very interesting. And when we talk about circular economy, we, we touch upon uh, consumption behaviors. And I was wondering, how did your citizens in, in, in Helsinki perceived this roadmap and perceived this uh, willingness of your municipality to move towards circular economy? Um, I have to say that one of the disadvantages in our roadmap is that it's mostly focusing on the city organization's own functions, not so much of the citizens. We are working with the citizens in other levels. But I can tell you about how the, the citizens have adopted this because they are very crucial here. So we work the, uh, the built the roadmap through workshops. We arrange workshops in all of the focus areas. Uh, we, when we invited the essential uh, experts from within the city to the, uh, the workshops and we asked them what they think are the biggest challenges in their work in terms of circular economy and how we should be addressing them. So we kind of tried to take the info out of them and, and then we built the roadmap based on this information. And when we had the draft ready, all the participants in the, uh, in the workshops had the chance to comment on the roadmap also. And uh, I haven't been also uh, uh, during the, the beginning of this year, I've been participating in different uh, advisory boards and directive boards in the city and I've been presenting the roadmap draft and, and collecting comments and opinions from the bosses and chiefs. So this is how we kind of try to, to gather the approval and commitment of the city organization to, towards the roadmap even before it was uh, politically adopted. And if you will have uh, one or two lessons learned to, you would like to share with the audience, what would it be? Collaboration. That's, you don't get further if you, if you don't listen to all the parties. Nobody can do, do it alone. So we need everybody on board. In, in the earlier, the better. Thanks. And I think it applies for all the areas we touched upon during the presentation today. Biodiversity, climate and circular economy. Well, thanks a lot, Leona. It was very, very interesting. Um, I would like to open the, the Q&A session with the participants now, so you will have the chance to ask your questions to uh, the speakers. While Ingvild is, uh, is uh, collecting uh, the questions from the chat box, perhaps I could start with a question to all of our presenters. Well, thanks again for your presentations. What I would like to know is like in all your areas, I guess you had to um, face different obstacles inside the municipality, but also outside the municipality, where indeed collaboration is one way forward, probably co-creation, engagement from day one is probably one. But I would like to ask you, all of you, if you have some lesson learned to, to, to share with us on how to make sure that you get everyone on board since day one in all your areas.
can start with, with Paul. Uh, hi, Louisa. I think it's simply a question of uh, information um, because um, it's, uh, everyone talks about biodiversity. It's a subject on everyone's lips. But a lot of people, they show an interest, but they don't know how to help. So it's simply a question of sharing our expertise and saying, yes, we'd love your physical presence. Here's our intellectual input to the, sub to the subject. And like has been mentioned before by some of the other uh, speakers, it's all about collaboration. So we get people involved, we teach them, we learn them, and then hopefully together we can uh, achieve, a, uh, achieve our joint goals. That would be my best idea, to be honest. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Paul. Gunia, perhaps. So information for Paul. Gunia, for you. Uh, yes, I, I, I would agree with Paul. That, that, that's very important. And I also think that, that uh, trying to build different kinds of networks is important. Networks, internal networks in our, within our cities with, with different disciplines. And, but also towards the inhabitants and, and uh, perhaps most of all uh, or organized inhabitants, whether it is on, on the NGO levels or, or, or if it's in, in a housing area level, we, we need to com communicate directly with, with people. And uh, that of course needs resources but uh, I, I think we we must have we, we must have this this very clear that that uh, we need to communicate with inhabitants more about these issues. Fantastic. So information, collaboration, communication, network. Uh, Karin, something to add, perhaps? Yes, I think so. Uh, first of all, it's great that you have a picture from Oslo on the slide now with the river and flood. <laughs> no. Um, we, I would like to take it a little step further, and I think it's it's really important that um, whether it's biodiversity or climate change or both, it it really needs to be integrated into the decision making processes and into the the procedures and regulations around planning and and decisions. So in uh, in Oslo, we have established a climate budget to really. Uh, steer our work towards the climate targets and that budget is part of the financial budget so it, it has a very formal role in steering decisions it also places responsibility for implementation at the relevant agency and i think that is a crucial point because it means that it's it's not only the department for environment and transportation that's responsible for implementing our climate measures, including adaptation and using nature-based solutions. The responsibility also lies with, with the planning agency, with the transportation agency, um, and so on and so forth. And that has really made a step change in, in how we work on, on climate and environment issues. Indeed. Well, thanks a lot, Karin. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the climate budget of Oslo is something very, very interesting that we follow very carefully at EuroCities because there are lots of interest from many cities to follow your lead. So I've got uh, integrated approach, communication, information, collaboration, network. Leona, last word is for you. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with everything that uh, everybody else already said. Um, yeah, that's the important point what Karin said about uh, having the strategic background we need that because that's a tool for us to work further that's very important to have there but also at least in Helsinki we have a huge city organization so to having how to spread information and and, and have everybody um, aware and on board and, and understand and speak in the same terms so that's that's a challenge so communication communication it's it can couldn't be emphasized uh, too much Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you. So I would like now to ask Ingvilde if you have some questions in the chat for the, our speakers. Yes, we do. Um, so the first one is from uh, Franco Petrarca. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, and it's for Gunilla uh, from Stockholm. Uh, he thanks you for, for an interesting presentation. And his question is, what kind of earth or preservation data do you use? Um, well, that's that's easy to say. Uh, we are using uh, a, a series of different earth observation data, you could say. 
but in Stockholm, most of all, we are we are using uh, analysis that are based on aerial photographs, infrared aerial photographs, and interpretation of those photographs into different biotopes, etc. Uh, we are doing a lot of, of ecological landscape analysis based on that. But recently, we have also uh, added satellite data to 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 this uh, to this ana analysis, and we are collaborating with. Uh, scientists uh, from from the Royal Technological Institute, among others, the Stockholm University, uh, in developing uh, new methods of, of mapping our nature and mapping the the changes uh, that are happening uh, on the landscape na landscape level. So it's a lot lots of different data sources actually. So I see, I see now that Franco. Um asks or makes an addition to his question, do you know the Copernicus program? Uh, I'm not very familiar with that. I think it's something on, on a European level, isn't it? With with satellites. Uh, yes. We're not so much uh, in, into that. Maybe we have t touched on it on some occasions, but uh, uh, most of all, we, we need very high resolution uh, photographs of Stockholm for our ecological analysis and satellites are improving in that respect. So, so we are looking into how we can use more satellite data. Um, but uh, at the present, we're not using, the, the, we're not part of the Copernicus project, I think. Um, we also have enough answer. Yes, I think so. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Gunilla. Um, so we have another we have another uh, question. Um, would any of, any of the speakers like to elaborate on what they think about the new EU policies and strategies that aim to contribute to these local initiatives, like the new circular economy and biodiversity action plans? Are these actions enough? And if, is anything missing? And which aspects are most important? Does any of our speakers want to um, want to reply, give a reaction to that? Um, I'll start, if I may, uh, Ingvild. Go ahead. I think, um, what's very important uh, is that it doesn't stress enough the, um, although it doesn't name uh, mention it, it's simply the, the economic impacts, because it's all very well that people concerned with biodiversity, concerned with climate change, say this is a problem, that is a problem. Like I think it was also um, one of the, my other colleagues mentioned, um, it's decision makers who, who make the decisions. And they're actually primarily only affected when they can see how it affects them in, in euros and cents. So I think we simply need to lift up the importance economically of these problems and then say, prove to people, do you know what? You have to address these problems because it's going to save you money in the end. And so I think that really needs to be hammered fast. And so people really need to know do you know what? This isn't just for nature. This isn't just for people. It's for your it's for your wallet, because because that is something which really makes a difference for politicians. That's just my personal opinion. Thanks, Paul. Perhaps another of our speakers would like to take the floor on this uh, on this question. Yes, Leona here. I can um, say something about the circular economy action plan. Uh, I think it's very good that it has a, a, a main, if you can say main focus, but a big focus on the product design. In designing products that will be repairable, reusable, recyclable and so on, that's very, very important. Uh, another thing from a municipal point of view is um, the, the emphasis on uh, public procurement, because that's one of the biggest tools we have in municipalities in, in driving these things forward. So this is these are very good things. Uh, but it's difficult to say because uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan is still on a kind of high level theory paper. So what are the concrete legislations or actions that the, the European Commission will do? So that remains to be seen, but I, I'm very hopeful for it. Um, maybe there could be more of the um, how to say uh, the citizen point of view, how to encourage citizens to make wise decisions. 
uh, and maybe economic tools, taxation, things like this, how to steer people more to the right direction. That I would like to see more in the, in the action plan. Yeah, which echoes a lot what has been said by Guinea before, that we need the right framework at EU level to enable cities to, to implement action at the, at the local level. I don't know if uh, Karin or Guinea, you wanted to react on this question? I'll just add, uh, uh, I think um, I fully agree with what's been said before, in particular uh, what Leona just said around the importance of public procurement and about bringing um, the action plans, uh, both the Green Deal, the circular economy and so on, more sort of down to the local level. Um, it's, it's, it's a fact already and that's going to be strengthened even more that uh, what happens in cities will be decisive. So I think it's important that that dimension of how how to promote a city development that can move faster and more rapidly towards a circular economy, towards becoming carbon neutral, is a really important perspective and that the benefit of having those sort of signals from the EU level are um, are quite considerable. Indeed. Thanks a lot, Karin. Um, looking at the time, uh, I, I wouldn't like to run out too much of time for the concluding remarks. So we'd like to give the floor to Janine Alm Eriksson, member of the Swedish Parliament for the Green Party and member of the Nordic Council Committee for a Sustainable Nordic Region for some concluding remarks. Uh, so Janin, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for very good presentations. Uh, so interesting and inspiring. Uh, I have learned a lot, which is very, very good. Because this is the decennium that we have to, to tackle, not only the climate crisis, but also the crisis for the nature, the ecosystem and uh, biodiversity. And here I think uh, that the cities has a very important role to play. Most people live here, many policies come up here, and they can also be centres for the change that has to happen. And uh, as we see with the, the Green Deal, uh, the ambitions has scaled up. And I think that we in the Nordic region and the Nordic capital has a very important role as forerunners as making good examples can also lead the way to this. Uh, we have been talking very much about climate and climate change uh, for the past years, which is good because it's, of course, very, very important. But now we also have to talk more about biodiversity uh, and that we have to have a new agreement uh, as the Paris Agreement, but for nature and to preserve biodiversity and, and um, make it happen uh, just in the same time as we tackle the climate crisis. And that's where policy coherence is very important between the strategies, so we reach the two goals uh, at the same time. And uh, I want to stress also something that was said in the beginning, that we have to have everything uh, together. We have to have the goals of all the political areas uh, moving in the direction uh, of preserving uh, biodiversity and developing the cities into to, uh, centres for for this. I see that we can have a, we have a very good opportunity now, but it also takes uh, brave politicians. I think we have a goal in the Nordic Council has a vision of uh, the Nordics being the most uh, sustainable and integrated region by 2030. And that is an important goal and vision. But we also have to have brave politicians that is ready to take uh, the decisions uh, that is demanded. Because uh, when we have competing interests, which we do have a lot in cities and in other areas too, it's important that we see that the goal of biodiversity is a very important one. And as was also said before here, uh, crucial, not only for, for well-being, but uh, also for the development of the economy. Uh, so I thank you very much for, for letting me in on this and uh, that I had the opportunity to listen to you all.
Thank you. Thanks, Elosianin, for those uh, positive words to conclude this uh, this meeting. I, I hope this event has brought you some food for thought and some fresh ideas. Nordic cities are front runners, driving transition at local level with concrete actions, as we, as we have seen, contributing to the Green Deal goals. Something I will personally take away from this meeting is that the European Green Deal and the transition towards uh, climate neutrality will not happen without the cities and the citizens. I would like to close the meeting by thanking all the audience. A big thank you to all our speakers for your insights and very inspiring presentation and for the beautiful pictures. I have been traveling uh, across Nordic cities uh, all morning. And thanks a lot to the European offices of the Nordic capital regions of Helsinki, Copenhagen, Stockholm and Oslo for organizing this very interesting seminar. I wish you all an excellent day. Thank you.